We are fellow residents who have found that there is a lack of pipeline information from non-industry sources, which makes it really difficult to determine facts versus rumor. So today's presentation is by property owners and for property owners. Pipeline easements often affect your property forever. You are under no obligation to speak to landmen in person. Your property may already have an existing pipeline unbeknownst to you. Eminent domain to seize property for a pipeline has limits. It does not apply to all pipelines. You can refuse a survey in some instances. Compensation offers from pipeline companies vary for many different reasons. Pipeline companies may intend to transport extremely hazardous products today. Pipeline negotiation should always take place in good faith. Not all pipelines have anything to do with America's need for fuel. And there are no laws or agencies that protect property owners from unscrupulous landmen. We're going to define some words often associated with contracts in the pipeline industry. Those words are easement and row, which is uh, the common industry name for right-of-way, and corridor. We're going to talk about the grantor or the lessor and the grantee and the lessee. We're going to talk about blankets, the term proposed, and the phrases burden of property and walking the road. Let's start with easements. The term easement and the term right of way are sometimes used interchangeably. They both, in some instances, are a concept. That's about where the similarity ends. So you, if someone's speaking to you about an easement or they, they go back and forth talk about an easement and a right of way, try to pin them down and see what it is they're actually referring to. Are they referring to the contract or are they referring to the piece of land? So that, that's where the similarity ends. They are both sometimes used as the concept. The easement is first an extremely important thing to remember about the easement is that you are the property owner, you are the seller. And you'll hear this several times throughout the presentation. The property owner is the seller. The land user, the pipeline company, is the buyer. And that's important to remember throughout this presentation because as the seller, you have no protections under the law. An easement is a contract between you and the pipeline company to use a portion of your property. If written in good faith, this contract, this easement, is created to protect both parties, the, protect, the property owner and the pipeline company. The written contract, the easement, is usually recorded in the local county courthouse. And you will find it under your parcel number, your property. An easement lasts forever. An easement allows a pipeline company to construct and maintain the pipeline. And that's very important, the maintenance of the pipeline. We'll talk about that a little more in depth later. The property owner is referred to as the grantor, as we mentioned earlier, the grantor or the lessor. The pipeline company is known as the guarantee or the lessee. Every easement should be custom made. It should be made to your needs, desires, and wishes. 
and what your neighbor wants is not is is for their needs and desires you may have different desires for your property so don't be swayed by what your neighbor decided before writing a contract and the property owner should be an active participant in writing the contract and if you aren't you can make corrections you can cross things out you can ask for less uh, you ask for dimensions to your desires so we've talked about easement is forever burdens the property what does that phrase mean that means it may limit what you can do with your land that's within that right of way. So you might not be able to put up a fence or a shed. You may not be able to plant a tree there. So burdening the property means you may not be able to use the land that you, the way you might have intended. An easement may reduce your property value. And the blanket. What is a blanket? When you do not specify <coughs> certain dimensions, which we'll go into a little later for your right of way in your corridor, you may be giving the pipeline company free access to all your property unless you specify dimensions. And before signing an easement, we recommend that you have an attorney read through it, look for contradictions, make sure that something said on the first page is contradicted on the last page or the third page. And an easement should never be done in haste and never be done under pressure. Okay, now we get to the right-of-way. What's a right-of-way? Right-of-way is the actual land on your property that the pipeline company wants to use. You still owe the, own the land. You still pay the taxes on the land. You might not be able to use that certain land to your liking. The free dictionary definition of right-of-way is the strip of land over which facilities such as highways, railroads, or power lines are built. The term right-of-way, as we said earlier, will often be referred to as row. You'll see that in writing. You also, in speech, they'll refer to the right-of-way as the row. The area the pipeline intends to occupy is the row. And with the row, the first pipe determines the first pipe laid determines the right of way. Okay, here's your home. First pipe, if you have agreed to a 50 foot right of way, the pipe will be laid in the midline of that 50 foot right of way. So there's going to be 25 feet on this side of the pipe and 25 feet on this side of the pipe. So remember, it's important, the first pipe determines the midline of the right of way. Row widths can vary anywhere from 10 to 400 feet more or less. The pipeline company personnel can the expression walk the row which means they can inspect the pipeline 24 7. that means day night that means christmas day that means easter morning the row has an unlimited ceiling and depth you've heard the expression the sky's the limit well in this case it really is the sky and the center of the earth are the extremes in this contract. 
Now this might not mean much to me, I'm a city folk, but anybody who's a farmer, that might be a very important uh, fact because the depth that a pipe is usually laid is 36 inches. Farmers may request a depth of 48 inches for plowing purposes. So typically the depth is 36 inches. Farmers might request 48 inches. And once a row is established, the pipeline company is trespassing if personnel, equipment, etc., go beyond the right of way. Watch for the term proposed in a contract. Synonyms for proposed are projected, anticipated, intended, suggested, none of which give me the feeling of a firm commitment. Remember, if the placement of the pipeline changes, remember, this first pipeline determines the right of way. If that changes, that's going to change your right of way. Say your contract says it, the proposed uh, pipeline is going to be laid um, here. Here's your right of way, but say they move the proposed pipe. What's that going to do to your right way? It's the center, right? So your center now is here. Are you closer to the house? Do you want them walking the pipeline, walking the road, checking that pipeline that close to your home? So where that first pipeline goes, is very, very important. Now we're going to talk about corridor. Corridor is the space that the pipeline inhabits. A corridor should always be less than a row. And again, we don't want to allow a blanket. So you want to have these dimensions written into the contract. Now this is especially true if more than one pipeline is laid. Okay, so here's your row, and you've specified <coughs> that a pipeline can only be laid, pipeline can only be laid in this corridor. Say you don't specify where the pipeline can be laid. Okay, here's your initial pipeline. Say your contract has a S after the pipeline, meaning you can have more than one pipeline. So now they're gonna put the, another pipeline right up against your edge of your right away. Now, when they come to inspect that pipeline, they're gonna be walking on your property, which is technically trespassing. So they're going to say, oh, well, we need some more room. And look what's going to happen. Here's your initial pipeline. You didn't tell them they couldn't come any closer. So you have to establish a corridor, which is the space in which the pipeline is laid. So in a case where you've established that corridor, you have your right-of-way pipe, which is the center, and you have a, a second pipe, but it's still within the corridor. <clears throat> now, sometimes when you hear all this information, you think, how, well, how does that pertain to me? Well, a property owner's life can be affected by a pipeline in these ways. Say there is a pipeline on your property and you want to sell your property. Well, it might be more difficult to sell your property with a pipeline on it. Say you want to buy a home with a pipeline already on it. There are some banks that maybe won't provide a mortgage for a home with a pipeline on it. Your insurance premium may be altered 
because of a pipeline on your property. How you spend your leisure to time, your time at home. Uh, if you have, say your backyard was a beautiful tree line and perhaps that had to be cut down because of the pipeline, well you don't have the same uh, feel of your home. It isn't, it isn't the home that you bought. Your privacy might be invaded. Where you plant trees, flowers, bushes, where you put up a shed uh, for your equipment. May, you may uh, not have uh, your own say where things like that go. The safety of pets, of your children, your grandchildren, and the possibility of wetlands being disturbed. Now, some professionals that we might want to uh, seek help from might be naturally an attorney to help you with the contract and insurance agent because once again your premium might be involved your mortgage holder to make sure that uh, a pipeline is not going to change your standing with the bank or mortgage holder, and a tax consultant. Uh, I was just at the library the other day and I heard a man come in and ask for a certain form because he has to claim uh, income from a gas well on his taxes. Well, the same thing might be true. If, they, if you get any kind of reimbursement, uh, any kind of income from having the pipeline on your property, you'll have to check with your tax agent or a tax consultant to see if uh, that impacts your taxes, your income taxes. There are two types of pipeline representatives, also known as landmen, who may approach you to sign an easement contract. The first type would be one who works independently negotiating easements with no specific project in mind. They may want to buy your rights to sell or transfer your easements to a pipeline company at a later time. So in this case, those representatives are working just for themselves. But in other cases, a specific pipeline company may be actively planning a route in your area they often subcontract a group of agents to do the actual negotiating. This method allows the pipeline company to distance themselves from personal contact with property owners. So over the course of time, you may expect to meet with several different landmen, all from the same subcontracted company, and they'll each have their own unique personalities. You may be contacted by letter, by phone, or in person, and they may tell you very little at first, except they can't wait to meet you and find it necessary to use your property for a pipeline. You may even feel special as though you've just won a prize. When dealing with landmen, we have every reason to expect that the personnel we come in contact with will be courteous and respectful. And above all else, these professionals should be exemplary with regard to honesty and integrity. In fact, all negotiations are legally supposed to be conducted in good faith. This is a very important legal term, <clears throat> meaning that all parties involved in a contract are always being honest with each other. Remember this term. If in good faith negotiations happen, Problems between the two parties should be few and far between. But at times problems do occur, and if they do, it's usually the property owner who is the one left unhappy. And there are three very serious reasons why property owners need to be extremely cautious during negotiations. Problem one is the easement contract that you will be asked to sign will most likely have a clause in it that basically means that nothing written other than what's in this document matters. 
we may receive cover letters to the easement, or we may receive survey letters, different documents that speak in really easy to understand language that seem to be explaining the pipeline project to us. But if your easement contract has a clause in it saying that nothing else in writing matters, then these you could probably pretty much just put in the trash. They mean nothing. And so it's very important that only what's in writing in the easement document matters. Problem two is that the easement contract that you will be asked to sign will most likely have a clause in it that says that nothing that was ever said to you verbally in person by any pipeline representative matters. You may be speaking with many different representatives over time, and so this is really worrisome. One told you this, another one told you that, but if the clause exists in this easement document, it would mean that nothing ha that has been said to you has any bearing. It must be contained in the pages of the easement document. Problem three is that there are no laws and no agencies that protect property owners from unscrupulous or unethical behavior of landmen. According to the Ohio Attorney General, property owners are considered the sellers in transactions like drilling leases and pipeline easements. So we have to take this very seriously. There are no laws and no agencies that protect property owners from unscrupulous or unethical behavior of landmen or pipeline companies. So make no mistake, the integrity of your landmen is absolutely crucial to negotiations. So when dealing with landmen, we need to listen very carefully to what they say. Respectable landmen should be acting simply as messengers, relaying information between the property owner and the pipeline company. They should be relaying only facts. So there are some phrases that we want to watch out for and Mary was going to demonstrate. G-A-E-F-R-A-R -E group. Okay. Okay, are you acquainted with our group? No. Well, we are the Geophysical Asset and Environmental Flexibility Reconstruction Assessment Resources group, and we're here because your property and you have an opportunity to be part of a wonderful new construction process that we're bringing to Portage County, and we are very um, encouraged because your property is ideal just and we're just making every attempt to uh, keep everything green and provide energy independence for America. Oh, well, that would be great. Yes, so uh, actually we have a deadline that we need to reach for our construction project, so we would like for you to um, sign this easement that we have here. It's a standard easement. All the right clauses are in it. Would you be willing to sign that today? Oh, I'd have to talk to my husband. Well. I know that if your husband is as nice as you are, it really won't be a problem. And in fact, we could even take you out for lunch if that would, if we could explain it to you there. Would that work? Oh, nice. Yes. Um, uh, so will you please sign the easement? Uh, not right now. Not right now. I need to think about it for well, a while. Well, you know, you don't want to become a bottleneck because this is an important project. And we um, have already got most of the easements in the neighborhood. And if you hold out, you will be the bottleneck. Oh, my neighbors have all signed. Oh, okay. oh yes, your neighbors have signed. And also, you should know that we have the right to eminent domain to take this land. You're going to take it? Well, yes. Um, but there is compensation. And if you just throw out a figure, we can give you as much money as would work for you. Really? I get to just name my own price? Well, pretty much. Why don't you just throw out a figure and uh, tell me what else would that take for you to sign? Well, easy. I, I... Look, lady, you have an existing easement on your land. We've already I checked already it. Do. We've already been to the uh, Portage County Administration Building, fourth floor. We've checked all the easements. There is I an easement on your idea. land. Yeah, I'm sorry. So it's going to happen anyway. You might as well just go ahead and sign. And I'm 
happy to drive you to the nearest notary public. Oh, you would take me? Because that would be nice. Yes. And I think uh, to, to be a holdout is just going to make a really big problem for this project. That's a lot of pressure. Yes. So, sign. Tactics such as empathy and threats, bribery and flattery are used. This should be a really big red flag. And these things that we have just demonstrated are real. They happen to property owners for real. So if landmen begin acting like salesmen, trying to talk you into signing and convincing you, you may wish to treat them as you would any other unwelcome or unsolicited salesman. You may ask landmen to leave immediately if they are offensive, intimidating, or rudely appear unannounced. A respectable landman will always try to make an appointment to meet with you, and they should never pressure you. If they indicate that they have a deadline, you don't have to allow their deadline to become your deadline. Ohioans are known for their hospitality and their courtesy, and we typically offer this, but we need to keep in mind that when land men are at our door, it is because they have a motive and an objective, and that is to obtain your signature on an easement contract. So you are under no obligation to extend hospitality to any who may become persistent or who may make you feel uncomfortable. In fact, you may be surprised, but you are under no obligation whatsoever to speak to a landman in person at all. You may instead choose to request that all communications occur only in writing. And this can be done by U.S. mail, or if you prefer, you can provide them with email addresses or fax numbers. If you do make such a decision only to write, you may find that the landmen continually request in writing to have a personal meeting with you, but you are never obligated to give in to such demands. After all, everything must be spelled out in writing in the easement document anyway. So there should be no reason at all that a pipeline company cannot comply with a request to deal with you exclusively in writing. Regardless of what means we use to communicate, you will be discussing terms and legal issues with these representatives to some degree. But we should be very careful to remember that landmen are probably not attorneys, and so they should not be explaining the law or interpreting the law to us. If you do have legal questions, they may be able, may be very eager to turn these over to their pipeline company's attorneys also. But landmen may not even be residents of the state of Ohio, and so they may not be familiar with how Ohio's laws differ from other states' laws. But pipeline attorneys could talking to them and letting them explain the law could be equally dangerous because those attorneys have a legal obligation to represent the pipeline company. They have no obligation to represent you. So this leaves the property owner very vulnerable. So please don't make the mistake of getting legal advice from either landmen or pipeline company attorneys. Pipeline companies and their projects should be transparent. You as the property owner have the right to understand the entire project, the proposed route, any existing routes that are already there, and alternate routes that they may be considering. So if property owners are contacted in a hopscotch-like way, maybe a person down the street over here is contacted and another neighborhood over here is contacted, Instead of going straight door to door where they'd like to put their pipeline, we have reason to wonder if the company is being transparent. So this prop pipeline will affect your property and your entire community. And so it's really helpful because of the hopscotch effect is to contact all your neighbors because obviously a pipeline 
will have to connect with some neighbor on some side at some point. So throughout all negotiations, it would be a great idea to involve your neighbors. Remember that the pipeline company has had years to plan for this project, but you usually don't have the same opportunity. Deciding whether to sign or not to sign a pipeline easement can be very overwhelming. And it could be that this is even the worst time in your life to deal with such a situation. But just because a request for a pipeline to come through your property happens suddenly, this does not mean that you must make your decision suddenly. So you pretty much have two choices. You can either go it alone and just hope you understand the terms and conditions that are in the easement document, or you can hire an attorney of your own. And so we need to know some things about attorneys. We'd like to tell you a few things about how they work. And as Kathy mentioned, the pipeline attorney is not the person to uh, represent you. He represents the pipeline company. He has their best interest at heart. You want a representative that has your best interest at heart. And unfortunately, that might mean that you might have to hire an attorney, which means uh, hundreds of dollars spent, possibly. We'll talk about how um, we might uh, mitigate that situation a little bit later. There are three reasons that property owners may want to hire an attorney. The first is if you want to sign an easement. The second is if you'd like to oppose a pipeline. And the third is if you have an existing easement already on your property. Now the first, if you wish to sign an easement, you retain an attorney who could possibly get you the best terms and the best price. The attorney is going to read every last sentence of the easement before you sign it to make sure there are no contradictory terms. A good attorney will look for these contradictions. He will work to protect you. You may even be able to receive your attorney's expenses returned if negotiations take place. Now, if you wish to oppose the pipeline, uh, the pipeline company may become very persistent. They may threaten with eminent domain. There may be some truth to these claims, or they could be empty threats. But the attorney is the one to handle those problems. As soon as you've retained an, an attorney, let the pipeline company know they should no longer be getting in touch with you personally. They should talk to the attorney only. They shouldn't be knocking on your door. They shouldn't be calling you. They shouldn't be send, sending emails. They should be going through the attorney if you've retained an attorney at this point. And the kind of attorney that you want is not one that's associated with the pipeline industry or has some kind of connection with the pipeline industry. You want probably somebody that's been personally referred. Uh, if you have a neighbor friend, if you have a family member who's gone through this before, uh, we can talk at the end of uh, the presentation about a list of attorneys. But you want somebody that you know is working for your best interest, for a property owner. Some local attorneys have graciously been offering a first-time consultation free of charge to property owners with pipeline issues. Don't be afraid to accept an offer. And when you do retain an attorney service, don't be afraid to talk about money. They have different ways of uh, being paid for their services. They may simply work for an hourly rate and wish to be paid as services are rendered. Some may offer reduced rates for property owners with pipeline situations, especially if you're working with a group. For instance, um, you might have a pipeline coming down your road. Well, talk to your neighbors. Maybe three or four or more can band together, and your cost of an attorney might be less 
if uh, there are several of you banding together in a group. This is an example of another way attorneys uh, can be paid for their services. Say you've retained this attorney and you've given him $200 up front. Now, you've negotiated a settlement at $4,000. The original offer by the pipeline company was $100. The difference is $300. Pardon me? I'm sorry, what did I say? I'm sorry. So 4,000 minus 1,000, the answer is 3,000. And your uh, attorney is going to take, some attorneys take a third of that, of this cost, and that comes down to 1,000. You've already paid $200. So you only owe that attorney $800. So there are different methods of payment for attorneys and uh, shouldn't be um, reluctant to talk about that up front. Now the third reason you may want to retain an attorney is that you have an existing easement. Say you signed the easement. You may still have right to contest that signing. Say you signed an easement and you've already gotten a check, but you haven't cashed it yet. You may still seek the advice of an attorney and he may, he or she may be able to do something for you even at that point. Now, if there is already an easement on your property, the attorney can help you uh, deal with the pipeline company. Perhaps the pipeline company comes to you and says, well, just like in Mary's example, uh, well, sorry, there's already a, an easement on your property. Well, don't accept that at face value. Ask for proof. Ask for proof that there is an easement on your property. And even if there is an existing easement, you may have the opportunity to sue or to renegotiate the conditions of that easement. Mary's going to talk a little later about a quiet title, and that may, may be a way of uh, renegotiating or getting out of an easement. Remember that legitimate and professional pipeline companies will always be upfront, transparent, and act in good faith. And remember, unfortunately, there are no laws to protect us from predators of all kinds. As Kathy mentioned, there are laws of predators of all kinds. There's child predators and, and elderly predators, and there are laws that can be taken care of that. But for property predators who would come and lie to you and try to get you to sign things, there are no laws that protect property owners. <coughs> And I just wanted to point out one thing. We might get really excited if we get an offer from a pipeline company of $100,000 because that sounds like a lot of money. But wait, when you consider that after you've paid your attorney fees, that brings the cost down to $66,000. Well, that's still a lot of money. But wait a minute, if you owe taxes, which will probably be in the neighborhood of 30%, that $100,000 offer just became $44,000 in your pocket. So it's not always what you think it is at first face value. But I wanted to talk about terms and pipeline easements because you may have very good reasons of why you want to sign pipeline easement. First of all, it's just simply your right as a property owner to do so. Secondly, you might really need the money that they offer you. And thirdly, in some cases, you might feel that you really have no choice if all your other neighbors truly have signed. You might feel pressured. So if a landman were to ask you what concerns you have during the negotiation process, you might be able to think of a few concerns to your property. But many people have shared their concerns, and they've done this by posting them on the internet. So over the past year, we've been collecting their concerns. <coughs> And so here are some things you may not have thought about to consider before you sign. 
Well, obviously we don't have time to go into all of these things today. And we have a list and we've condensed them into some major topics. So you should have that in your handouts eventually. And you need to understand what all these things are and consider them to whether they affect your property or not. Some things might affect your property, some may not. But I wanted to quickly go over compensation concerns because the price that you will be offered is not just a matter of a flat fee all the time. Appurtenances are structures that they might want to put on your property and of course uh, if they do this you would want a much <coughs> higher offer if there will be permanent structures. The size of the pipeline, the bigger the pipeline, the bigger the price you should be offered. The pressure of the pipeline would bring you a greater risk to your property and your family. So the greater the pressure, the higher the offer for compensation should be. They may offer you a signing bonus. They may need to put up a temporary construction area to allow equipment um, to be used all the way down the easement line. There should definitely be higher compensation if they're going to use your property for that. If the property they want is full of trees and you could sell those trees for money, well, once the pipeline easement goes through, you will not be able to have trees that would continually over the decades reproduce and replace themselves. So you would want to actually get compensation for future timber loss over many years. There's also price per linear foot of pipeline laid. And of course, the property that you still own may be reduced in value because there's a pipeline in it. It might be something that isn't as easy to sell. So there should be reimbursement and compensation to replace the loss of your property value. And if the products that are going through are a little riskier, maybe explosions could happen, then compensation offers should be higher. Inconvenience, there may be things running for 24 hours, seven days a week, noise and that type of thing. And of course, compensation for damages, should they damage something and not repair it themselves. So it's not as simple as just a flat rate when it comes to a pipeline offer. Contradictory terms means it might say one thing on the first page of the easement and then somewhere else buried in the easement you need to go through with your fine tooth comb and your attorney needs to go through with his fine tooth comb or hers. Um, there are six of them. The first one is it might say one pipeline is to be constructed but when you read the easement it ends up saying pipelines plural or there's the word pipeline with an S in, uh, in parentheses. The second one is that the pipeline will be one size. If it mentions one size on the first page, does it mention later on that it retains the right to change the size of the pipeline? There's a big difference between a six inch gathering line and a 32 inch transmission line. Um, number three, especially old easements might talk about what product is transported, might just say petroleum, but perhaps later in the easement it might say other related refined products or other liquids or substances or any substances. Those are the kinds of um, extra things that are added that we have to look for. Number four, appurtenances. These can be above ground. I also found out yesterday doing some research they can be below ground as well. But construction sheds, power stations, pump stations, related or accessory facilities. Facilities is an operative word. It can mean above or below ground things that you may or may not want. And, and um, we've learned that the word appurtenance should not appear anywhere in your easement. You can strike it out. Number five, temporary workspaces. You can strike that out and be wary of, of uh, temporary workspaces that include it's temporary as long as they leave equipment on it because they can leave some rusty old thing on it and say, well, we're coming back. It's not, it's not terminated until we get our equipment off. That's something to be uh, worried about. And then finally, who's the contract with? You thought you signed with this company or that company, that 
easement is going to change hands. And for example, on our property, we found out our easement has changed hands five times. Well, more than five, but it's not recorded everywhere, so we really don't know. Essentially, eminent domain is a legal way for land to be acquired, even against a property owner's wishes, to be made available for public use. So it can be used for roads that the public actually uses, and schools that the public actually uses, and energy that the public actually uses through utilities like water and electricity and fuels. It might seem odd, but the rules related to eminent domain were actually created to protect our property rights and not to rob us of them. The rules were designed to prevent private companies from unnecessary takings. Without limitations, we might see a manufacturing firm try to take <coughs> our properties to transport paper clips through high pressure chutes like the banks use. But this would clearly be an abuse of the powers of eminent domain because rather than for public use, it would most directly benefit their own private industry. So if ever private industry could claim our properties for their own private economic use, it would really open up a can of worms. And maybe literally. So then could a live bait producer use eminent domain and take our properties to ship worms through pipelines to get them to market faster? And would milk transporters be able to take our properties against our will to get milk to market faster? Would medical waste handlers be able to take our properties to get products to injection wells? You see, it would just never end with industry. Today, industries are transporting ingredients to make plastics for hospitals. While we'd all agree that these plastics are definitely useful, even life-saving at times. The companies that transport this ingredient, ethane, are doing it for profit. Essentially, no different than a live bait producer or a milk processor. So these industries do not seem to meet the public use requirement in Ohio law to seize our properties against our will. So we never want to confuse products which are useful to the public, because that would be just about everything we buy, with products that are used by the public, which would be energy and fuels, water. So what it boils down to is that the rules of the Ohio Revised Code were designed to protect our rights from being violated by pro private for-profit industries, even those that transport very useful products through pipelines. Speaking of products, you may be surprised to know that pipeline companies are limited as to specific products for which they can use the process of eminent domain. So we're going to move on and talk about pipeline products that are mentioned in the law. The Ohio Revised Code at section 1723.01 does allow for some pipeline companies to exert powers of eminent domain, both to survey for and to construct pipelines, but only for certain products with the purpose of public use. So I'm gonna read the code. If a pipeline company is organized for transporting natural or artificial gas, petroleum, coal or its derivatives, water or electricity, then such company may enter upon any private lands to examine or survey lands for its tubing, pipes, and may appropriate, which is another word for take, so much of such land as is deemed necessary. So for products that are natural gas, oil, oil products, crude petroleum, and natural gas, the possibility does exist that a company may attempt to seize our property to construct a pipeline. Oil products would include such things as gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuels, things most of us actually use every day, products of which we can clearly see the public use aspect. So if a pipeline company is claiming to transport these products, you might think that it is just simply automatic that they have 
the right to take our property against our will. But that isn't necessarily so. While you may have a fight on your hands with the pipeline companies, there are a few things you might want to keep in mind. Besides the public use requirement, the company also has to prove necessity per the Ohio Revised Code at 163.021. Proving necessity is a really big deal. So first of all, they would need to prove the necessity for the whole project of the pipeline, the whole project why they need this pipeline. Secondly, they need to prove the necessity for each individual parcel taking. So eminent domain is supposed to be used only as a last resort, and the pipeline company is supposed to exhaust all other alternatives before they would bring forth suits against one specific parcel. But recently, pipeline companies are beginning to transport other products which do not seem to fall in the listed categories in the Ohio Revised Code. So if there really is no true threat of eminent domain, it is up to property owners to become acquainted with other pipeline products in order to make the choice of which they will allow to be transported via the terms in their easement documents. Pipeline companies are wanting to transport things they call liquefied minerals and mineral solutions. To date, I have not been able to find any industry definitions describing or identifying liquefied minerals or mineral solutions. And these terms are not li listed in the Ohio Revised Code as products worthy of eminent domain. Some pipeline companies are also attempting to transport brine. And as you can clearly see, brine is not listed in the Ohio Revised Code. And there's a clause that's being inserted into easements that we all need to be really worried about. It says, any other liquids, gases, or substances. So this is really just a blanket phrase that would allow a pipeline company to transport basically anything and everything. It could be paper clips, it could be worms, but more seriously, a blanket clause like that could allow products which could be radioactive, toxic, medical waste, and again, the Ohio Revised Code doesn't mention and anything pipeline in the list. So if you're signing a pipeline easement, you can strike off terms of those products if you're going to consider signing. Or if you choose to allow those products, your compensation offer should be much higher to give the pipeline company that much freedom. But a really serious concern today now is that the industry is using terms that group products together and they want the ability and freedom to transport multiple products. So we're gonna look at some of these terms that don't sound harmless at all. Liquid petroleum gas, liquid petroleum products, liquefied petroleum gases, petroleum products in a liquid state, refined products, that doesn't sound dangerous, hydrocarbons, Petroleum products, natural gasoline, condensates. But if we, didn't, if, if we didn't know better, we would think that these all were related to fuels. But if we look to see what they all have in common, they have in common something called natural gas liquids, and that includes ethane, a very dangerous, hazardous product that does not seem to be in the Ohio Revised Code. <clears throat> Natural gas liquids include things like ethane, butane, propane. They're extremely flammable and dangerous, and they are used mostly for industrial purposes rather than for public use. And there's another Ohio Revised Code. It's 4905.03, and it specifically states that a company transporting natural gas liquids is not considered a public utility. So unless new legislation is enacted or the Supreme Court decisions get handed down to change things, natural gas 
liquids, including ethane, are not products worthy of eminent domain. So if you are thinking of signing a pipeline easement, it is up to you to limit or restrict by easement terms which products you will allow to be transported. Be sure that you and your attorney both check the product clauses in the easement contract and understand what every one of these products are, especially when they're multiples, before signing. Understanding these product definitions give us the tools needed to make educated decisions. So for products which do not seem to have the powers of eminent domain, an opposed property owner can more emphatically say, no, no, I don't want it. But if you're not opposed and you see no harm in allowing these products in a pipeline, then your compensation offers should be much higher. So if the offers are not to your liking, well, the pipeline company will just have to reroute around you. So to conclude the products portion of our presentation, you should know that if you oppose any pipeline through your property, any pipeline at all, you always have the right to just say no. And in some cases, a pipeline company may threaten eminent domain, and they may actually have the right to pursue it, or they might try to pursue it. And if a pipeline company is persistent, you may have a long, drawn-out battle ahead. If you have received a really low offer, in some cases, you might be better off allowing eminent domain to take place. You will still be paid for your property, but the courts decide the amount of compensation. And depending on your situation, court-awarded compensation may be significantly more than what you were offered by a pipeline company. And if it is, the courts may also award your attorney's fees to be reimbursed on top of that. So you should know that although two little words strike fear into all of us, eminent domain could be the best choice in the end. One of the first things a property owner will want to know is if they've received a fair monetary offer. But oddly enough, every last term of an easement is made public record in the courthouse, but not the negotiated price. So in regard to compensation, the industry indicates that one property might be more valuable than another one. And this makes sense if one property would contain equipment or buildings or structure, while another one just simply has the pipeline running through it. But when we're talking about straight property value prices, it doesn't make sense. For instance, one Orange County property owner reveals that a pipeline company made just a flat rate offer of $1,000 for a 50-foot easement about 300 feet in length. So you would think that for double the land, if it were 600 feet in length, it would be double the price, so $2,000. But this actually happened, and the neighbor with the larger property was offered $3,000. So it seems that there really is no rhyme or reason to initial offers at all, and it's usually never a good idea to accept the first offer. Also, community involvement may help us to understand the project better as a whole. If secrecy and privacy seem to be the character of a proposed pipeline, it could be a cause for concern. For instance, we may be the owner of parcel number one, and they would like a 50-foot easement through our property, which adjoins our neighbor, parcel number two. And if we don't communicate with this owner, we might not realize that the pipeline company also is negotiating them with them for 50 feet. So if we both sign an easement here, allowing 50 feet each, we find that the pipeline company ends up with a 100-foot right-of-way. Well, if you both allowed for appurtenances, then that would be really appealing for a pipeline company to put really large equipment on there, or facilities, or build a building, especially if it's very close to a public road. They have all rights to that property. And these structures could be very noisy, unpleasant, and possibly dangerous. Community involvement may also help property owners achieve a community goal. 
It could be that they wish to oppose the pipeline entirely going through their property, or as a group, they might wish to get the best terms and compensation that they can get. So either way, talking to their neighbors, working as a group is the best thing to happen. And again, an attorney may work well with a group. And there's one more reason that community involvement is important, and there could be long-term residents that live nearby, and they may know about existing pipelines or easements from years and years ago. So it's really important to find out if these exist. approached with a claim that there are already existing easements against your property. And in some cases these claims are true, but in others they're just not. They're false claims. So it could be that a farmer decades ago signed a pipeline easement and over the years his properties were parceled off and sold and homes were built. If the farmer had signed a pipeline easement, the easement is said to be running with the land. And this is a legal expression, meaning that it is active forever, regardless of the transfer of ownership over the years. So it could be true, if you don't know what a farmer did decades ago, that you may have a property with an existing pipeline easement. It also may be presented to you that you have an electrical easement already, and so the pipeline just automatically has rights to that electrical easement. This is very unlikely. So property owners should always require proof and protect themselves by demanding to see actual documentation. If pipeline representatives can't seem to find the paperwork, then it probably doesn't exist. So at least demand the volume and page numbers at a county courthouse so you could look up this information for yourself. So maybe you already have an existing pipeline easement. You might think that the pipeline company has unlimited rights to your entire property, but this is very dangerous to assume. You see there are terms in the existing easement document and it could limit the pipeline company in many ways. For instance, it could be limited to only 10 feet, but now the pipeline company might need 50 feet. So you have the opportunity to renegotiate an easement. There also be, could be limits to the size of the pipeline that's allowed to be put in the ground, and limits to rights of ingress and egress. How are they gonna get onto that easement? There could be limits to what products flow through the pipeline. So if a pipeline easement says just petroleum, one word, petroleum, that literally means crude oil. So it's possible that that's the only product that they're allowed to transport forever. And this would prevent them from being able to repurpose the pipeline if you object to other products. And the, I'm sorry, the easements may actually have a termination date too, some do. So you might be totally free of the easement. So since pipeline companies cannot go beyond the terms that are already on record, you may have the opportunity to completely renegotiate from scratch. And you could also get much higher compensation then too. So we encourage you all to research your properties now to find out whether you have a pipeline easement or not. So there are a few ways to do this. Title insurance policies may have made note of them. Your deed at the courthouse may have notations in the margins. You could pay for a complete title search from a title agency, and this might cost about $500 per parcel. And once you know where you stand, then you may be able to relieve your property of an older easement with a quiet title action. And Mary's going to talk about quiet title. Quiet title, as Kathy was just saying, is about the only way you can actually get rid of an easement unless there's a termination date, which so far we've really only heard of one easement that had a termination date. There are two conditions you need for what's called quiet title. Your attorney is going to go before a judge, and the two conditions are that he will that he can choose one of 
one of the two. One is that the easement does exist, uh, but the pipeline was never constructed for 21 years. The other condition that's possible is that the easement exists and the pipeline was constructed, but it was never used for 21 years. So one of those two conditions, your attorney goes before the judge, tells the judge this is the situation, you want the easement um, taken off the, uh, taken away, made void, whatever. And the cost for this here in Portage, from what we've learned from talking to real attorneys here, is about $5,000. Now, that's a huge amount of money, it's a really big hit, but there are three reasons to think about why that might be a good idea. One is, if you can get rid of the easement, you may want to renegotiate, as Kathy was saying, for a higher price. That's number one. The second one is, um, how might you have used that property differently? If you were planning, if you plan to live there for 20, your 20 more years and you want access to that land and you were planning to build a barn and raise horses or you were planning to put in an organic garden or you're a painter and you want to build a studio and paint or you're a musician and you want to record music in a studio, that easement is going to make that land impossible for you to use. So now it's, you will never get that income. So consider if you're going to have that land to use for 5, 10, 15 more years, how much money would you have made? And would that offset the cost of seeing this, paying this attorney $5,000? And then the third reason to consider quiet title that might make it worthwhile is how much devaluation has your property suffered by being burdened with the easement? And once the easement is off, will the property value come back up and be higher than what it was? So in the end, it's something that you have to weigh. So as we're gathered together today in this location, we may notice that we don't smell anything unusual. And we look around and we don't see anything unusual. And so this makes us feel very safe. But not in Southern Portage County because the pipeline company has changed the product they are transporting in an existing pipeline to ethane, one of those natural gas liquids. It's extremely hazardous, flammable, invisible, and odorless. Despite reassurances of 24-7 monitoring, the pipeline company sent an informational flyer to all nearby homes warning that in the event of a leak, residents may need to flee the area immediately by foot. They have been advised to warn neighbors. However, they are not to ring a doorbell, use a metal door knocker, flip any type of electrical switch, or start their vehicles because even a small spark could set off a neighborhood explosion. First of all, ethane is not safe to breathe. It displaces the oxygen in the atmosphere and the first sign of a leaking pipeline might very well be when a resident just falls unconscious. Ethane concentrates really low to the ground, so children, pets, and wildlife will be the most vulnerable in the event of a leak. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, warns that, quote, high concentrations in the air cause a deficiency of oxygen with the risk of unconsciousness or death, end quote. Ethane is not safe to touch and may cause frostbite. The gas is heavier than air and so it may spread over long distances. And so distance ignition, somebody sets their uh, ignition turns their vehicle on it could flash back and blow up over here and evacuations may occur if a fire ignites it may not even be safe to put it out because of how ethane reacts with water and so they safely claim they claim that they can safely bring this industrial product through residential neighborhoods so no, today's pipelines have nothing to do with America's need for fuel. So if you have come here today thinking that signing a pipeline easement is nothing more to consider than just a piece of metal in the ground, nothing could be farther from the truth.